discussing the topic of uh, big profits with new builds in great locations. My special guest presenter today is Danny Buxton of Triple Zero Property. He knows more about the pros and cons of investing in new property than anyone else that I know in Australian real estate. So today we're going to be looking at some case studies of people investing successfully in new homes. And also I urge you to stay tuned um, to the end of the webinar because towards the end of the presentation today, Danny will be providing details of a special offer, which is potentially worth around $1,500. Now today's topic is one that particularly interests me because it, it speaks to a key decision for all investors, whether to buy an established property or whether to invest in creating a new one. And the answer to a certain degree uh, depends on the individual, but for many people investing in new real estate makes a lot of sense and an opportunity to generate lucrative gains. So how do you do it? What do you need to know? Danny Buxton from Triple Zero Property is the best person to provide the answers. So welcome, Danny. Thank you, Terry, for your very kind words and introduction. Um, yeah, look, obviously we believe that uh, there is no one size fits all approach to investing and, and obviously uh, there are some reasons why buying and building new, uh, sorry, buying an older property it might work for some clients, but for us, our real focus is, is the, the new builds and we see there's a lot of benefits uh, for our clients in that process. And so it's an area that we specialise in and they've been doing so for nearly 15 years. Um, excited about today's uh, webinar because it's, it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, actual um, examples that we have done for clients or in the process of doing where there's some uh, variety of different uplifts and, and, and good yields that, that we've been able to achieve for clients. Uh, I think it's very important just before we talk that uh, uh, today, uh, the material that we talk about today is an overall or a summary and should only not be considered as actual advice. Uh, we always believe that you should uh, get individual independent advice before you do anything, whether it be through uh, a financier or planner who you have confidence in in that process. So there's a bit of a, a, um, a brief there for you to read at your leisure when you go back through and, and review. Obviously today, uh, as we talked about in our introduction, we want to talk about the benefits of investing in new homes also the importance of choosing the right location because that's really important and that's obviously where we work very closely with Terry and I think anyone who subscribes to his uh, hotspotting reports will uh, find that information is, is very a very important part of that process. Look at some current case studies but also talk about some of the pitfalls that we're seeing people make and ensuring that you put the right process in place and I think if you uh, put all those ingredients together then uh, uh, you are certainly on, on the way to achieving success through your investment journey. So getting it straight into it, uh, we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, in fact, tomorrow, Terry has a webinar with uh, Peter Folds from Washington Brown. And one of the benefits, which I'm sure they'll cover off in uh, probably more detail, is, is the benefits of investing in new property and uh, the importance of tax benefits that are there through depreciation, giving you, the investor, increased cash flow. And uh, it also helps reduce your tax payable. Um, it creates affordability for, for owning your new home. And obviously, the yearly deductions are typically thousands of dollars uh, to an investor. So I'll give you an example of a property uh, that we have recently done. And that is actually a photo of an investment property we've done for a client. Package around about 530000 as a house and land purchase. The client was on a PAYG of around about $90,000 with their income. Uh, we're able to achieve uh, before handover of the property, get a tenant in there of $525 a week. So we're getting a fairly good yield there of just over 5%, just on 5.2. Um, they borrowed 100% uh, plus their costs using equity in their home. Uh, as well as the purchase of, of the new lending. Um, before we even did their tax depreciation, this property was um, around about uh, $20 a week, uh, neutrally geared or positively geared. But by adding in that extra depreciation through the Quantity Surveyors report, was able to give them an extra $80 a week positive gearing. 
Uh, and I guess, I guess with any investment, you've got to remember cash is king or, or cash flow is king. And I think... Uh, um, so, if, so, Danny, is this a, like a, a four-bedroom, two-bathroom type, type house? Yeah, in this particular example, which I'll actually go in a case study, in our case studies of, of one very similar to this, four bed, two bath, two living, double lock up, uh, on, in, a, in an area which is what we see as good long-term strategic growth. There's already been growth in this property, uh, just as we're seeing land prices continue to increase and we're seeing uh, resales of the like. So, um, so for us, uh, that is great. But also, too, the importance of in new home, and again, the tax benefits there, makes it really affordable for the investor to hold. Uh, but it's also we're not going into a really expensive property um, whereby it's, it's again getting that cash flow mix right for this particular client. Yeah, it's interesting that the dramatic difference it makes um, for the depreciation report from cash flow positive just $20 a week to $100 a week. That's quite a difference. Absolutely, and that's really makes it beneficial, particularly when you're building a portfolio of properties. Um, the thing is, it's really important to understand that your depreciation schedule can't be done by an accountant. It needs to actually be done by a quantity surveyor. And we're big advocates of, of Washington Brown, who we work very closely with, who's also part of the panel of partners. Um, and uh, we just find Peter and his team just a wonderful to work with and, and, and great. Quantity surveyor's report will last for in about uh, 10 years before you need to really relook at redoing that. Uh, but it's... The big thing with brand new property is there's lots that we can claim up front with your um, plant costs or your fixtures and fittings. And so invariably they can be written off anywhere. Some things will be two years, some things will be 10 years, but it's that first five to six years where there's increased depreciation, which gives uh, that real good cash flow. Uh, that will then peter off, but as that peter off, we're going to see the rents continue to rise in those areas. So. Uh, it, again, makes it affordable for you, the investor. The the other reason why we like new as well, and this is actually one of our clients, um, is being new is it means that we can really be strategic around the design of the house um, that meets the demographics of that particular area that we're going into, uh, we, which gives us increased rental demand and rent. Tenants have a tendency to want new property, and we're always able to achieve higher rents uh, with very little vacancy. In fact, right now, again, we'll talk about this a bit later, but the vacancy that we're achieving is, is we, we haven't seen in over a decade, yeah. particularly, on, particularly on the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, Danny, uh, Dean, who's, who's listening in, was just asking what the location of that example that you had on screen in the previous slide. You're talking about the uh, Sunshine Coast in this case? Yeah, there well, was one on the Sunshine Coast in uh, Aura, which is a, a big master plan development uh, by Stockholm. Uh, and I will actually talk about, uh, Dean, I'll actually go into a little bit more detail of an example of one in a little bit more detail that we've done for a client uh, that's just about to finish. Uh, but we're also getting increased rent. Uh, that's because the design, as I said, is really based around, it's important to understand the demographics of an area that you're going into. And why we like new is it allows us to, as we're seeing change in demographics, ensure that the house meets the needs and the demands. Um, it's funny enough, just probably the last 12 months where we were looking at particularly our four bedrooms where we're positioning uh, one of the bedrooms at the front, which then tends to, again, become like a home office for a client. Uh, as we're seeing more and more people who are working from home, uh, just worked in just, you know, just really well with us with the COVID uh, and the demand. And we're finding that our properties are being rented. Uh, we start marketing some of our properties around about four to six weeks from completion and our property management division, uh, Rock here, uh, we're having multiple applications, uh, four to six weeks out and getting the rent that we'd normally expect to rent in the summer, which is the higher, highest demand, we're actually getting that rent now, uh, four to six weeks out from completion. Yeah. The other reason we like new too is that there's very little or no ongoing maintenance and maintenance can be a big burden. And a lot of people don't realise that you know, there's about, if you've got an older property, you need to probably budget for around about $5,000 a year in repairs or maintenance because things can go wrong and they can be quite costly, uh, which, which is really about 100 bucks worth a week to your cash flow. So 
Yeah. Danny, you touched on the, um, the advantage with new product being able to design for the demographic or indeed for the trends in the market. And you touched yeah. on that, that home office thing. One of the, the prevailing trends that we're seeing is, is more and more people working from home, something that was been underway for a while but exacerbated by the lockdown phase that most parts of Australia has, have experienced at some point. So are you seeing that as, um, as something that's changing in the design of new buildings, the, the demand absolutely. for um, the ability to work from home comfortably? Yeah, absolutely. And also providing and, and having uh, internet accessibility in, in a good way. Fortunately, in the new areas that we're going into, there's a requirement that it has to be, the property needs to be NBN ready. Uh, we've got good connections with uh, specialists in that area. So we're even able to help our tenants uh, the, the moment they move in, they've got a property that's that's already got the high speed internet capability for, for that. So, uh, which is what they're wanting, what they're needing. Um, interesting enough, we're also finding too that the, the needs and requirements, having the big big backyard is an important. Having a bit of a yard they like, but also accessibility to open space, and and that's what a lot of the new developments are able to provide. But also too, with the it's interesting enough with the growth. Uh, prospects that, that you talk about a lot in, in uh, we talk about offline a fair bit, but also in, in your reports, Terry, it's some of those satellite areas, satellite cities like your Bendigo's and your Ballarat, down in Victoria, certainly like your Newcastle's or your, your Hunter Valley from Sydney, but also to Orange or places like um, here on the Sunshine Coast, where you see sort of people working in the city, they can maybe commute one or two days a week. Uh, but also have the, the flexibility of working from home or working from home one or two days a week and spending the other time in the city. So they're going more for that lifestyle. Yeah, yeah we, we call it the, the exodus to affordable lifestyle because we're seeing people vacating the big cities, the big expensive and congested cities like Sydney and Melbourne and uh, moving to lifestyle areas where they can not only have a more relaxed and less congested lifestyle, but uh, access uh, quality homes for a much lower price than they can in the, those central city areas. And it's, it's a big, big trend. And um, the sort of property that you're talking about is uh, providing for that trend. You touched on the vacancy rates um, and you're talking specifically in, in this case study of uh, the Sunshine Coast. But uh, you and I both know that right around Australia, particularly in the regional cities, uh, vacancies are ultra, ultra low, which means that there's, there's demand for new product um, and it's not really being met by current supply. Absolutely. Look, there is there is a big issue. I mean, and a part of that trend is it used to be the um, empty nesters that were tending to move out, but now it's the people with families, and we're seeing a lot of the families. Uh, certainly on the Sunshine Coast, you know, we've got a population of around about um, uh, 340,000 people, which will grow to around about 580,000 people in the next 15 years. That's significant growth, and, and there's not enough land being developed. And that's actually been uh, even further exacerbated with the, uh, that we were just talking before the work, uh, the webinar, with first home buyers and, and a lot of those first home buyers entering into the market, uh, which is scrambling for that land. So uh, we, we're seeing increased owner occupiers uh, into these areas and, and for investors, it's a real challenge to, to be able to secure land unless you have the opportunity to secure it off market. Uh, which is a lot of what we are able to do for clients. Um, so again, the benefit of investing, which is what we're talking about here, uh, is the growth as well. And the direction which probably values travel is is only partially dependent on the broader market conditions. You've also got to look at the micro as well. And uh, the all important what we call 60% comes down to that more individual factor, which we've just been touching on location, the style of housing, its design, its inclusions, and again, making sure that we're also sourcing property and we're building property that meets the economic requirements of that area, that we're not overcapitalizing or undercapitalizing as well. And so um, uh, it's just a really important factor to, to take into account. We'll be talking about location, and really that's really probably, to me, Terry, probably one of the most important parts too in the process. Your research is really imperative. You know, we. Uh, I love the fact that where our office is located, we, we share the floor with Heron Total Light, uh, Sunshine Coast team, and, and been able to sit down and regularly just have those those chats with the team there about what they're seeing, and they're certainly uh, looking at um, uh, 
uh, the, what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, and, and it's quite interesting how buoyant the market is right now, uh, particularly on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, that's their area of expertise. And also, too, from a rental perspective. But your research is imperative. You know, look, I think it's, it's if you're not subscribing to Terry's uh, reports, you should be, if you're thinking about uh, investing. Uh, but there's also other areas where you can get that uh, uh, research from too, to to work with that. But make sure it's independent. Um, you know, that it's not from, you know, there's no, Terry's not there trying to sell you something. It's just giving you the research and the data so you can then make an informed decision. Uh, you know, when you're spending a half a million dollars, it, it's, it's ludicrous not to look at investing in, in a few hundred dollars to be able to get access to something that can help you in that decision. But the key indicators, as, which Terry, you probably know this better than anyone else, obviously looking at that sustainable population growth, not just now, but in the future. Look at the demographics of the area, the changes that are actually occurring. Um, and they continue to occur, look at the infrastructure spending. Don't just look at public, but private as well, because I think that's a really good indicator. Uh, the affordability, both for tenants and you, the investor, again, looking at the bigger picture, but also looking at the nitty gritty, because that can make a big difference on, on just choosing the right lot in the right, in the right location. Uh, and, and it's making sure that you don't buy with your heart, you buy with your head. And, and we unfortunately, we do see a lot of people who, who buy because they love a particular area. And to me, investing is not about what you like, it's about where you make money. Uh, and it's really trying to remove that emotion uh, from that process. I like the, the list of criteria that you've listed there, Danny. The, the one that, that's really important for us in the uh, construction of our reports and our selection of locations that we include in our hotspots reports is, is infrastructure spending. Uh, we just think it's so critical in driving growth in a local area. Because we think property markets derive out of local economies. It's essentially about what's happening locally more so than what's happening nationally. And uh, infrastructure spending can be a massive generator of, of growth, creator of jobs, improvement of amenities, uh, generation of economic activity. Sunshine Coast is a, uh, an extraordinary example at the moment, but there, there are many others around Australia. And I know that in your case studies, you, we're going to be looking at other locations that um, tick a lot of the boxes in the way that the Sunshine Coast currently does. And when we talked about uh, what to talk about today, obviously we both felt fairly strong that Sunshine Coast would be an important area to talk about uh, just due to the, I guess, the growth that is, and, and the, the future growth that's going to be occurring here. Um, look, it's, it's now recognised as a significant urban area in Australia. Uh, there's really strong levels of population and economic growth that occur, and it's been interesting, the impact that, that COVID, you know, looking at what impact COVID would have, um, and yeah, we're still seeing uh, really strong levels of, of, of property growth. Some of that, not a lot of that, but some of that has been driven by interstate. Uh, people looking to move up, certainly some of that hiring, which is really interesting, talking to Heron Todd White. Really the high end of the market is, is very strong at the moment, um, particularly in that Noosa area, coming back into Minyama, the water. Uh, the waterfront areas, the beachfront areas um, in uh, Bedina, Bocarina areas there, which then flows on, and that then obviously flows out from there as well. Uh, and that's yeah. in that multi-million dollar sort of price range. And to, me, to me, there's a linkage between the infrastructure spend and the fact that you have just mentioned the top end of the market. I mean, the, the medical precinct alone would, would be driving a lot of that because a couple of years ago, those big hospital and related facilities weren't there and suddenly there's this whole world-class medical precinct including a two billion dollar university hospital and other things that have sprung up around it and that's bringing a lot of new people to the sunshine coast many of them highly paid uh, medical specialists um, just to work in that facility and obviously they're looking for somewhere to live on the sunshine coast and i think at least some of the demand at the top end of the market is coming from that you're also seeing businesses from a lifestyle perspective, businesses relocating, uh, some fairly uh, decent sized businesses looking at the Sunshine Coast. Big push by council here to attract businesses, particularly into the new CBD, which is behind us, um, uh, where our office precinct is, um, uh, as there's now new construction going on there. There's also a lot of uh, 
infrastructure spending on on roads and, and actual infrastructure that's going on. Um, a bit of a pain in the neck driving around at the moment with all the upgrades to the highways and the motorways, but it's for future benefits. Yeah. But, um, but it's a, a billion dollar spin just, just on the, the highway along the uh, the western fringe of the Sunshine Coast strip. It's um, that's going to be, be great when it's all done because, yeah, we've got to negotiate the mess at the moment, but when it's done, it's going to be um, great for the Sunshine Coast. The rail line, I know there's a bit of argy-bargy with, with state and federal government always over that, but... Uh, uh, that's looking at giving the big ticket approval. And look, obviously, just the, uh, it's a great place to live. And I think people are, and I think what COVID has done is it's got people to sit down and think about well, where do I enjoy living? And, and look, I look I'm, a, I'm very biased. I think Sunny Coast is a great place to live, whether it be here or in the hinterland. Uh, where you are is, is um, it's really good. I think, too, we just talked about the, the rental market. I mean, as I said, it's, it's just for us been incredible. I've just got a little graph here. Uh, which just looks at here just the, uh, I guess, as you can see at the beginning, this is this year alone, where the tenant inquiry, always very strong in uh, that uh, January, February, March. We always try to push for rentals to come up for renewal in that time because that's where we tend to get the maximum rent uh, for our clients. But we're actually finding that we're achieving rent. In fact, we're hitting record rents, uh, property that we just did recently, couple of years ago for a client in Pridgian Breeze, Pridgian Springs, um, or Pridgian Beach, sorry. Um, we uh, just a, a five bedroom house on a 450 square meter block is now renting for 640 a week, uh, which is giving our client almost close to a 6.6, 6 6.7% yield just on a normal house, um, which is great. But we're getting at least 5% across the board in everything and anything that we're doing without having to try too hard. So that demand is, is, is really there uh, in that rental. But um, well, the other areas that are experiencing the look, we're, we love what's going on in, in Brisbane. We think there's some really good opportunities in Brisbane, particularly around that um, North Brisbane area, around that peak tree. We've got the new uh, university campus there. I know universities are in a bit of a hard space at the moment, but it isn't long term. Um, but uh, certainly... The new university campus there is uh, for 10,000 people uh, in Petrie. Mm -hmm. uh, so tapping into that, that's very close to the North Lakes Precinct, very easy access to the highway. Uh, you've got the train, you've got uh, airport, you've got all that northern infrastructure there, all that infrastructure spend with the duplication of the runway in uh, Brisbane and the massive amount of infrastructure that's going in around that uh, Brisbane airport area, which is just jobs, jobs, jobs and more jobs. Yeah. I think proximity of jobs notes is such an important factor and a lot of people think that that means you've got to be close to the CBD because everyone works in the CBD but the reality is they don't. Most people don't work in the CBD, they work in suburban jobs nodes and in Brisbane the biggest jobs node is what they call the Australian Trade Coast uh, precinct which is the commercial industrial precinct that sprung up around Brisbane Airport you mentioned but it's also very close to the Brisbane Seaport, they're clustered quite close yeah. together. So the commercial precinct around that is called the Australian Trade Coast. That's the biggest jobs node in Brisbane, and um, that's up in the north, northern part of the city. So the area that you're talking about, the, the Moreton Bay local government area in the north of Brisbane, is very well located for approximately towards that, that massive jobs node. There's been a lot of infrastructure to spend in the last few years with um, that whole uh, upgrade of the gateway arterial. Uh, to the airport from that northern corridor uh, from from um, the highway and around through that digging deviation and, and so you've got far greater improved accessibility but for those who do work in the city too with the tunnels um, it, it, you, it, it just it decreases that travel time significantly and and then also even going from in so from the north of Brisbane to the south of Brisbane or out west uh, is is now uh, time Travel time has been decreased dramatically. So, yeah. uh, but they've, just, they've, just, they've just spent a billion dollars upgrading the, the Gateway Motorway, which feeds through the, the Gateway Bridge linking the north and south sides of Brisbane. And, and there's more being spent. There's more coming up. So they're, they're continually upgrading that. Um, and so it's become such an important arterial route um, for people in Brisbane getting north and south, north of the Sunshine Coast, south of the Gold Coast, or to other parts of Brisbane. 
We love, uh, again, just where time, love Ballarat and Bendigo. I think they 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 speak for themselves and, and um, we're just seeing great success. We're going to do a case study on a property we're, we're just uh, uh, finishing for a client in Ballarat. Um, but again, two really key strategic cities for Melbourne CBD uh, have already, they stand alone in their own right, but being satellite cities to Melbourne just really adds, it also adds that lifestyle uh, and affordability uh, for people who are in, in Melbourne looking for a little bit more space. You've got really good education. Education is really important. Again, such a coast, you know, the amount of private schools and choice for people in, in their education is, is very important. And that's something that we always look at when we look at going into an area. What is the, what schools, what are the private schools, state schools? Where is that demand for, you know, we don't mind driving 20 minutes to work, 30 minutes to work, but we only want to be five minutes to school with our kids screaming in the back on a wet Monday morning. Trust me, um, I know. But, um, you know, in Ballarat, I mean, Ballarat has a phenomenal amount of schools, university precincts, um, education, but also jobs and, and infrastructure spend and significant infrastructure spend both from the state, uh, federal and also local council and private. So uh, they're two areas that we really do speak uh, and we do feel there's real opportunity for good sustainable growth over the next little while. Yeah. Terry, you're... Yeah, look, um, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about this, the second wave of the virus in Melbourne, but um, talking about real estate markets and places like Ballarat and Bendigo, I think they're, they're getting a second wave of a different type and it's related, I think, to the, the pandemic. Um, I've, I've been watching Ballarat for the last, say, three years and it's been one of the one of the number one markets anywhere in Australia in terms of price growth. It's been a phenomenal performer uh, for all the reasons you've just articulated. But I, I felt that it was sort of getting to the point where it had peaked perhaps, but it's, it's actually got a, a second surge um, and it's very much related to the pandemic and, and that trend we talked about, the exodus to affordable lifestyle, the lockdown phase has opened the eyes of more and more people to the possibility of working from home. So places like Ballarat and Bendigo, uh, some figures published, um, I think it was... Um, by one of the two big websites, either realestate.com.au or Domain, about searches and the, the leading locations in Australia for, for searches, people interested in buying property and moving to a place of Ballarat and Bendigo. Um, they're, they're the national leaders. Um, people out of Melbourne in particular wanting to go to these places um, for, for all the reasons we've talked about. Regional New South Wales, again, I mean, look, we, we're seeing great uplift for some of our clients where we're doing uh, duplex options for people in that uh, Hunter region in Maitland and uh, Newcastle area where we're seeing uh, clients see an uplift of, of from at completion of, uh, from valuation to valuation of, of $120,000 to $200,000 just through through the build process through duplex. And again, I've got an example there of one here on the coast. And look, I think... One of the sleeping giants, which we always talk about, is Adelaide. Adelaide is is uh, is actually, uh, with all the data that's coming out, is still seeing property growth uh, across the board. And there's some great little pockets in Adelaide which um, are worth seriously considering and looking at. And it's actually really affordable as well. So yeah. you know, for someone who's on a budget, on a tight budget, those areas like, those, like that Bendigo and Adelaide uh, are areas that... Uh, that really do do work well. So, yeah. and, and its market is pumping really strongly. Anybody who goes to Adelaide as an investor or as a buyer's agent to try and buy something there becomes aware of just how competitive it is in Adelaide. You actually have to move quite quickly to secure a good property because it, it is so competitive. And um, it the tends... Coast. Right, the sunny coast. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I love the prospects in Adelaide. Um, I could talk about it for an hour, and I'll, I'll, I'll resist the urge. But just to say that um, it tends to fly under the radar screen for a, a, a lot of investors. Um, people need to be aware that one of the reasons why Adelaide is, is so strong and will be strong is because um, technology is pretty much driving the world. That's where the future is, and the the Australian leader for high tech innovation and technology is Adelaide. Undoubtedly, it's the Silicon Valley of Australia. Many of the big um, companies, international companies that have set up their headquarters in Australia to have an Australian presence, like Elon Musk, for example, like Technicolor, they don't set up their headquarters in Sydney or Melbourne. They set them up in Adelaide because that's where it's happening in terms of that particular... And, and um, 
they governments really embrace that and really really working with uh, those companies to continue to see that uh, investment coming through so, yeah. so we talked about uh, case studies so we're going to look at three actually four case studies uh, but to me it everything to do with property and investing in property is it's all about the numbers and and it's 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 about understanding the data the research having the right team around you but also understanding the numbers so that first uh, to, I think it was Dean that asked the question, here is a property that we actually have completed or just, just about to finish for a client. Um, this client is actually happens to be a property valuer um, and approached us uh, through, through a actually referral from an existing client. Uh, this is in the Aura development on the Sunshine Coast. Um, it's due to handover uh, in about a week and a half, two weeks. Uh, and it is already leased or rented for $525 a week. We had multiple applications. Um, in fact, uh, we had some really good, very strong applications that um, uh, was great. And again, we're continually surprising just, uh, we have a property management division in here called Rock Property, which is our, our property management team. And uh, again, we're just consistently achieving zero days on market. In fact, if you asked us, from a rental perspective, how many properties do we actually have available to rent right now? We don't have any uh, at all. We've got no vacancy. We've got zero vacancy and have had zero vacancy for some time. Um, so that strong rental demand, which is very important to look at when you're investing. And it's a very, the back of mind of every investor is how quickly will my property rent out and will I achieve uh, the expected rent? Um, uh, so we, we tend to give a range to our clients and we're achieving that higher end every time. Um, so there's a gross rental yield there of 5.2%. Uh, we see really good solid long-term capital growth here. We've already seen a $15,000 increase for our client just through this build process. Uh, what we love about this particular property, uh, we are positioned in between uh, five, 600 metres between two schools. So we've got a state school, uh, up at one end uh, that's just been approved for construction. We've got a Catholic Peter 12 school that's just been approved and will start uh, shortly. Uh, we've got a park uh, literally at the end of the street, uh, 100, 100 plus metres, around about 100 metres from the end of the street, a really nice big park with open space. And then at the other end of the street, open sporting fields, community centre and the like. So again, looking at that, uh, infrastructure spend that's specific in the area, the, the proximity and walking distance to, um, I kind of, I don't mind having to hit a golf and always try to think of, you know, how far from the property to the next hole am I to certain infrastructure, local infrastructure, but also big infrastructure spend because one and a half K, just over a K away is the new CBD that will start construction in the next couple of years, which will see continued growth in this area. When you look at the Aura CBD or the, the Aura Central, um, it's gonna have like a, a Stockland Westfield style shopping center, the size of that of North Lakes, which is quite significant. Uh, Civic center, people's place. Um, once you see that, you understand it. And it's funny, a lot of locals are now going, hey, I wouldn't have thought of investing here but when they come down, they see it, they go, oh, wow, I didn't realise this was on my back doorstep. So that's one. Another one, which was in Ballarat, which we're doing uh, actually for a good mate of mine, uh, who we've done a number of properties for in uh, Alfreton in, in Ballarat. Uh, it's due to hand over at the end of uh, September. Again, very strong rental demand. If you actually look on realestate.com, there's only... I think, uh, look, yesterday, only nine properties in that whole suburb available for rent. Um, and so they do get snapped up very quickly. Why? Uh, because of its, its, its position, it's in the school catchment zone for Ballarat High, which is highly sought after. Uh, it's in a very central location in the development with a park just literally uh, 20, 30 metres away around the corner. Um, again, we've seen really good... Uh, the rent, rental yield is always a little bit less in Victoria, but to get a, a nearly a 5% rental yield in, 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 in Victoria is fantastic, uh, which we've been able to achieve. But the growth of that property, uh, we've seen a 12.3% increase in value 
uh, from when the client uh, went to contract on the property. Albeit, there was a, uh, a delay in registration, um, uh, which has only benefited our client in our process. So without really spending any money, we're starting to see increase in value right off the bat. So we've got some very happy clients in Ballarat. Um, Danny, just before you leave Ballarat, um, Nash is watching and listening um, ask the question, would you also look at uh, suburbs like Winduri? Um, also mentions Bonshaw. I'm not familiar with Bonshaw. Do you know that, that suburb? I'd have to have a look uh, at that one. So um, again, uh, when we look at suburbs, we also want to look at the, the development and the developer as well. So it's really important to understand that when you're buying, you've got to look at who's your builder, which again, I'll talk about in the pitfalls. Uh, and you've got to put all those things together as well as the, probably the key part is also the location. But um, um, if, if he wants to shoot us an email, I'm happy to come back and, and have a look at that in more detail for him. Okay. So another one here, which is is which which I think is fantastic and very excited about. This is literally hasn't been released to market yet. So I've um, been working with one of our panel builders, uh, and we were just talking. He mentioned that he was looking at something on the line. So we worked with him uh, and his team on this. So uh, <coughs> so this is to be released. We've already got a client who is is taking one of these, but. Um, why I like this is it actually is, uh, we're able to do a single contract on this uh, as an SMSF compliant purchase for someone who wanted to do something in their super fund, which works really well because the growth here is also the rental growth. We've got a yield there of 6.7 to 7.3 or 7.2. And to get that in a residential property is, is fantastic. So this is a dual key uh, property. Uh, the price is, is fantastic. It's actually a terrace style dual key. Uh, very close to the university precinct in Kalanga Petri border. It's only uh, 700 metres to the train station at Kalanga. It's an infill development, which means it's in an older area where there's been a knockdown of a house. Uh, it doesn't mean the land's been filled up. It just means that it's been knocked down uh, and it's surrounded by existing infrastructure. It's actually less than 2 k's to the Westfield Shopping Centre, uh, obviously the rain, uh, the railway line, the new university, really close access to the highway, um, uh, which is fantastic. It doesn't, it's not one of those probably the backside of the highway, you got a certain distance away. Um, we like this, it's got that three bedroom, two living, uh, plus a separate one uh, by one uh, as well next to it, uh, which gets that uh, rental growth there. So, and again, just this position is just perfect for continued capital growth as well. But why I picked this and choose this and wanted to demonstrate this is, is, is there are a couple of options that we have uh, oh, for this. Uh, nice, modern, clean, but uh, just get a really high uh, rental yield, which uh, a lot of people are chasing. Uh, uh, so it's, it's growth focused and yield focused. So, Big tick from us uh, and getting that depreciation just adds even further benefit as well. Danny, just a comment coming through from one of our, um, our listeners, Mandy Lee. Um, just a comment. Uh, she's an investor in Ballarat and she says, I love my Ballarat investment. It's gone up in value 40% in the past three years. And um, I know from our research that those sorts of value increases over the past three years are fairly typical of what Ballarat has delivered but is continuing to deliver. Yeah, look, I, I still see a couple of years of, of good growth there. Uh, the challenge we have in Ballarat is just making sure the pricing's right because you, for us, we're also trying to manage the yield and the rental return. And for us, once that price gets over a certain point, uh, we, we're still chasing the growth. But again, we want that affordability from a rental perspective. And I think that's where um, those who are in Ballarat, who have got into Ballarat or, or thinking about going to Ballarat, get in now. Uh, we're certainly able to assist you in that process because that's what we do. But also to Bendigo is worth, we, we see Bendigo tends to follow those a little bit behind Ballarat. Uh, and there's a lot to be said for, for Bendigo as well. Um, I know we yeah. talked about the case study. So, um, yeah, when, when you talk about Geelong, that. Geelong, then Ballarat follows Geelong, and then Bendigo follows Ballarat. Yeah, um, there's no doubt that Bendigo is a little bit further back in the cycle. Than, than Ballarat is. It's, it's, it's still rising. 
Um, it's boosted definitely by infrastructure spending. or $700 million spent on a new hospital there a couple of years ago, which is typical of, um, of how the state government sees Bendigo's importance in the overall scheme, scheme of things. But um, it's, a, it's a great regional city. Um, it's growing. It's got economic diversity, uh, good links to Melbourne, um, yeah, and it's a, a great place to consider, I think. Absolutely. So, um, and look, again, that's one of the things why we, we like that uh, Northern Brisbane part as well, just the, again, the infrastructure spend that's been going on there. Uh, demand for land, there's, there's not a lot of development left in those areas. And so it's that rejudification of older areas, and uh, we just see a um, uh, really good opportunity. Um, where we've seen great success for our clients is in that duplex space. And I mentioned um, in uh, Maidland, in, in that Newcastle Hunter region, where we've seen some fantastic results for our clients. But also here on the Sunshine Coast. And so this is a property um, with one of our clients who um, I actually spoke with you as well, uh, uh, Terry. Uh, just, just wanting to get some information. Uh, who's based in, in New South Wales and maybe uh, listening to this. So, g'day, mate. How you doing? Uh, so, there's a property. Uh, this is actually a photo of, of, a, of another client's property that we've done, which is very similar. But it's a duplex. Uh, so, our clients just recently have been able to secure some land which uh, is suitable for a duplex here on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, this particular one is also in Aura, uh, which is very hard to get. Um, but I uh, was in a unique position where he was able to get all his ducks in a row, make sure his finance was right, so we were able to jump on the opportunity uh, with the developer there, secure the land, and we're able to uh, get the right build uh, to get uh, the right achievement. So the rental appraisal, and we're already confident whether we're achieving this, of 475 a week, so that's at 950, so that's giving him a gross rental yield of 6%. Uh, and we see again that solid long-term capital growth because of its location within the estate, its proximity to all the uh, the aforementioned um, uh, infrastructure that we talked about. But we've had another duplex which uh, a client has actually purchased, and during the construction of that property has on sold, um, and uh, the settlement is at completion of that duplex, and he sold the same property for $940,000, uh, which is just 200 metres away in this uh, from our clients. So we see an immediate uplift of, of $120,000 for our client just through that uh, process. And it's because we're, I guess, going through that development, we're actually developing that property, taking that one property, going through the DA and strata of that property, creating two, two properties there. I love duplexes. I think duplexes are great because it gives people options from an exit strategy. Um, yeah. It allows someone to be able to uh, hold and, and get the rental yield. It allows them to keep one and sell one and maybe pay down either debt on their own existing dwelling or, or on the other property and increase the yield or actual, actualize the growth and either sell the property and, and, and take the cash and run. <laughs> Uh, obviously, there's capital gains implications there, so they just need to talk to their accountant about that, or use the equity to go and do another property. Tony, you've, you've illustrated pretty graphically the capital gain potential in a project like that. I'm just interested in the just how much positive cash flow it might be generating. An early example, around 500000 with a 5% rental yield was about $100 a week. With this one, it would be considerably more, I think, wouldn't it? Oh, look, with a depreciation, absolutely. Uh, I haven't actually uh, sat down and broken down those numbers, but uh, abs there would be no doubt uh, that, I mean, with a gross revenue of 6%, there would be um, at least, um, having a guesstimate here, probably around about $180 to $200 a week positively geared. Again, depending on that person's personal circumstances, whether there's been, uh, for this client, there's been a mixture of cash and borrowing. So, so it's... Uh, for them, it's actually going to be a significantly higher uh, yield for them. Uh, look, I've used the lower end of the number of the uplift. We've got another client who uh, we've been able to get higher. And look, I do believe there's actually more uplift than what we're talking about here um, because that's based on right now. And again, the process is about a six-month process during the build process. And we're going to continue to see growth in that area and demand and getting actual stock 
is a real challenge. And it's, it's really important for our clients to make sure they are, uh, have got all their ducks in a row. I think Louise Lucas spoke about this uh, really well in your webinar a couple of weeks ago about making sure you, you've got your finance sorted out and, 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 and be ready. So um, I'll talk about that in a moment. But It's, it's really important that, that people have all that lined up before they dive in. Uh, just in relation to that uh, case study you've just been giving us, the duplex, Danny, uh, Nash is asking, is this Torrens title or a strata title duplex? Strata title duplex. So, so a, able to sell two separate properties, if you wish. Absolutely. 100%. So we actually go through that process. We actually do that as, as all inclusive, all inclusive in the process. So that's a fixed price that we do for our clients. And one of the things that we do, which is which I'll talk about in our in pitfalls, everything that we do for our clients, that, that price is locked in. So for our client, uh, Wes doesn't have to worry about anything else. He knows that price is locked away, locked in irrespective of what happens. Uh, he knows that um, he can go to the bank with knowing that there's no more to pay in that process. So it's just mitigating all that risk for our clients. So there are a lot of pitfalls a lot of people make, and I think one of the things is, is and I really want to talk about is where are you getting your advice? We had a, a client that we were working with um, up north who works in the mines, and we've been able to secure a property for her and her partner, and it just ticked every box for them. It was just ideal for what they were trying to achieve, right down that process. And then last minute, um, rang up in a panic because she'd been talking with her colleague or her boss and her boss said, look, no, don't buy property. It's gonna collapse by 40% over the next three to four months. Don't buy anything now, you're gonna be able to pick up a bargain in the next three to four months when the whole property market collapses. Now, um, my question is, is, is it's important to seek independent advice, but where are you getting your advice from? Uh, who, who's that specialist? What's their experience? How many properties have they bought uh, over the last six, six months, six years? Uh, for us, uh, this is what I do. Not, I don't just talk to people about investing. I invest with the same strategy. Uh, I, I do the same thing. I invest where my clients invest. I build with the same builders that my clients build with. Uh, so you gotta make sure that you're getting advice not from Uncle Joe, who, who just has an opinion on everything, but actually doesn't do anything. And uh, that's why, uh, again, Terry, I know we're having this conversation, but we're independent. Uh, you know, if someone wants independent advice, go talk to someone like Terry uh, and get that advice on, on what you're doing. Be careful you're not just chasing bargains. Uh, or a bargain-based build, uh, because invariably there's a reason why it's a bargain, and it may always be a bargain. Or if you're chasing a cheap build, um, that's what you're going to get. And invariably, where we've seen a lot of people getting unstuck is they're signing on build contracts for X amount, but it's ended up costing an extra 10 to 15, even 20 percent more than what they think. So you know, watch where you see builders promoting, you know, house from with that little asterisk and there's all the fine print. Um, and it's often when you go through the build, what's included, but actually what's not included is just as important. Um, and you think you're getting something and you're not. Now I've had uh, big blurry men with beards and high vis come in and, and look very, very scary. Come in my office, sit down and plonk down and say, Danny, I need your help and then end up bursting into almost uh, tears because they've uh, got themselves into a prickly situation with a builder who's not cash strong, who's going through uh, their bills taking three times as long as what they thought, their builders chasing money or has extra variations and charges which they didn't think that they were there. So we just think it's really important to get the right advice and that's what we do as part of our process. Um, uh, we are a, like a building broker uh, that's part of our process. So it doesn't cost anyone anything. We, we are paid by the builder, the panel builders that we do through a profit share arrangement. But um, it's important to get good financial finance advice as well. Talk to your lender. Uh, make sure you know exactly where you sit and you know what your absolute budget is and how much you can go to because you don't want to get caught in that situation where 
there's variations and all of a sudden you're scrambling to try to find money to pay the builder. But also to not getting the right legal advice. And we're always big on, on getting the legal advice before you sign your contract. There's lots of uh, pitfalls there. That's where that previous person made the question about uh, some developments in Ballarat. Uh, we want to look at the developer. We want to look at the development and the contracts to make sure that there's no hidden costs, even in, in purchasing that land. That's very important. Which leads on to, I guess, getting all your ducks in a row, the right process for success. And I know, Terry, we're doing a, a shoot uh, next week um, about the importance of building your team. To build your portfolio, you need to build your team. And, and that's, I can't suggest that highly enough. And that team needs to be independent. Uh, I had a colleague, uh, some clients of ours who got caught up just recently uh, through a company that was doing a phone around um, and got them in a car, started driving them around properties and saying, no, we're going to buy, they tell them they can buy four properties straight away in these areas that were deemed for capital growth and, uh, and pressured to sale, you know, to sign a contract there and then. And they did the finance, they did the legals, they did everything in-house where they've already got a good team, they've already got a good lending institution, they've already got a good law firm that deals and works with them that's independent. You know, they've already got the right property strategist there. And she rang me up and said, Danny, uh, I think we've been hoodwinked and we paid all this money up front and, and we sat down and we looked at it and the properties that they were suggesting were just abhorrent. I mean, I'm just, you know, in their super fund, looking at buying a, a unit which was only going to give them around about a 3% return just didn't make sense and so look go back to your financial planner go back to your team because this this is not right you know we know we can do far better than that and by being smart and by being strategic so again you've got to start with the end in mind what is the purpose what is the reason for buying this property and that's the most important thing once you know that get your finance sorted out be market ready just as what louise said in her because that way puts us in a position that we can go in and we can negotiate to get the best deal, particularly with land, uh, with the developers, that puts us in a strong position. Get legal advice before you sign a contract. Um, work with a strategist who understands which is what we do, uh, so then you can get yourself ready for success. And I know we're running out of time as we always do, but I'm sure there's some questions coming in, but. We, we do have a special which we want to talk about briefly and then we can go to some of the questions there. But uh, anyone who wants to utilise us through through uh, uh, as a bit of a hot spotting uh, special is we'll contribute or we'll actually reimburse you to about $1,500 to your professional fees uh, in your conveyancing. Uh, we've got a great uh, team that we, we do work very closely with, with... Um, uh, SC Lawyers and a little bit of plug because they're also now part of the panel of partners with um, Terry. And I think it's always good to promote uh, people who are part of that, um, your, your partner group there, uh, Terry, because they're all independent. They're people with, with integrity. We like them because they give a fixed price to all of our clients in, in their legals uh, here in Queensland, certainly. But even anyone who we're working with, we're able to uh, reimburse them uh, $1,500 towards their uh, their professional fees as, as a bit of a special for today. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Um, just turning to some of the questions that's come through and encourage people. Um, in the, we've still got five or ten minutes, so please um, type your questions into the, uh, the chat box or the Q&A panel and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the next five or ten minutes. Kevin's asking if I purchase a build property through a company registered for GST. Can the GST on the bill be claimed back? So can you repeat that? Uh, Kevin's asking, if I purchase a build property through a company registered for GST, can the GST on the bill be claimed back? Look, I'm not an accountant, so I can't give you that advice. Um, I think you... Your entity, if your entity is registered for GST, then you can claim the GST back. But if your entity is not registered for GST, uh, and a big caveat here, I'm not, uh, again, go talk to your accountant by that. But I, if the bill company, I don't believe so, you've got to be um, registered for GST yourself. 
Okay. Um, just some um, questions about locations. As we've talked about some uh, specific locations that uh, that you like. Um, uh, Darren's asking uh, whether, whether Perth is, is, is considered worth, uh, worthy of consideration. I certainly have some strong views about that. And what about you, Danny? Look, uh, I'm still on the fence. Uh, look, I, I just uh, obviously going through the data that you said, sent through. Uh, probably, again, probably, I'm a little bit conservative. And I think because I used to be a school teacher, I've got that conservatism in the back of my mind, just wanting to look. Um, certainly, I think a lot of that growth, in, particularly in land sales, has been through uh, the first home buy scheme, and I think a lot of that has come through. Um, just wanting to see just uh, more numbers in the infrastructure. Look, mining is strong at the moment, um, and it certainly that also has a big impact. I think thirty uh, percent, uh, if my memory serves me correct, of the uh, actually, I think it's a bit more than that, of the economy uh, in WA comes through mining and resources. Actually, I think it's a little bit higher than that. Um, and when the resources are strong, uh, Perth is strong. And um, um, and I, certainly that is the case at the moment. Um, but there is certainly some good opportunities there. Uh, and it's something that um, through our uh, some of our partner groups, we're able to help clients in that space. But... Um, uh, again, I, I just believe all property is a long-term strategy. And there's no get rich quick through property. And, and I do think where Perth sits on the cycle and on the property clock, as a lot of people talk about, uh, over the next few years, I think there's some good opportunities that will exist. Well, I think, firstly, there are opportunities to buy well in Perth because it's been in a bit of a slump in terms of prices for a number of years. I do believe it's coming into a growth phase um, it, uh, the numbers um, are increasingly supporting that. Vacancies are now very low in Perth. Rents are rising. The economy is improving. I think one of the consequences coming out of this pandemic period is going to be a resource, another resources boom. So I think Perth is going to benefit from that. Yeah. Uh, note that Bernard Salt, the, uh, the famous demographer, newspaper columnist, author of five books on... Um, subjects related to real estate. Um, he's uh, this week in the media suggesting he thinks Perth is, is beautifully placed to, to benefit from the times we're in. It's going to perhaps have a, a multi-year growth phase. So there's um, plenty of mail suggesting that now would be a good time to consider Perth. Um, another question from Lydia, Danny, about whether we think uh, Tasmania is a, a good place to invest uh, in new property. Yeah, look, um, we have looked at Tasmania. I think part of the challenges with Tasmania is the cost of construction uh, is quite high. Um, I, I think Tasmania, in my view, um, it's probably coming towards the end of its cycle. I think there's probably better opportunities elsewhere. I think those who have invested in Tasmania have done well. Um, but I think... Um, uh, it's it's a bit of a wait and see for me. Um, um, I'd probably defer that one to you, Terry. I've we've mm -hmm. looked at it. We can see for the pricing that we've seen there now, it's starting to get up there. That we're not sure how sustainable the rents are going to be, and so I, I I then just automatically default to places like Adelaide or, or, or Bendigo. To me, I think for the same sort of money, you can see better uplift in growth. Yeah, I think, I think you may be right that, that certainly Tasmania and Hobart and, and Launceston have had a great growth phase for about three years. They've been great performers. Um, taking a long-term view, I think Tasmania is a good place to consider. Um, Hobart still has vacancies around 0.5%, so there's, there's a shortage of rental property. Um, one of the significant things is that uh, Tasmania and the latest Comsec State of the State report was elevated to the number one position, which yeah. is extraordinary because, and, and a large part of the, the time that I've been doing what I do, Tasmania is kind of ranked rock bottom last amongst the states and territories on most economic indicators, but gradually in the last, say, three or four years, it's risen up through the rankings and now it's number one in terms of how Comsec constructs that report. So that's a, a big feather in the cap of that. Um, of our smaller state. Um, in the long term, I think it's got good prospects, but I think you're right, Danny, that's probably right now sort of um, past the peak of the current cycle. Uh, I think so, 
going against what we just talked about, I think in um, uh, through our, our, our partner company is, is if I was going into Tasmania, I'd probably look at something where we can value add through a small renovation or something like that uh, and pick up some of the stuff in those areas that are already um, already built uh, where you're in that um, middle ring of Hobart where you might be able to pick something up, um, just tidy up and then get that increase. But um, again, people wanting to do that, we, we can certainly assist them in that process. Through yeah. it's, it's, it's the build side of things. There's the cost of getting materials in uh, does add to the price. It can be done. We're just going to be really strategic with how we do it. So Kevin's asking, uh, I guess, some of the, the meat and potatoes questions about the process of, of doing a new build. What are the typical payment outflows during a build and how long does it typically take to complete a build? It's a fairly broad question, I suppose. Is it possible to answer simply? Very quickly, uh, the great thing with building is you only pay stamp duty on the land, not on the whole purchase price. So you can save yourself... Um, quite a, a big amount of money that just goes to the government and I'm all for trying to not pay the government as much as we, you know, as much as we already do. Uh, secondly is um, you, you buy the land, you settle on the land, you've then got a construction process. Our construction process for a single property, a single level property is around about 16 weeks from slab going down, which invariably takes about four weeks from, uh, from settlement. So you're looking at about 20 weeks to handover uh, with a two story, it is between 24 to 30 weeks, depending on, on the complexity of the build. Um, you do have costs uh, associated, which is your holding costs during construction, and you'll have drawdown payments to the builder. But when you add in those holding costs uh, and interest on that, it still works out cheaper than what it would be with paying stamp duty on the whole, on the whole process. And by building, it allows you to uh, claim 100% on your deductions as opposed to buying something that's already been owned by somebody else, which you do miss out on on your uh, your fixtures and fittings costs, which can be quite a big chunk uh, during your, uh, which I'm sure Peter will talk about tomorrow. Okay. Um, lots of questions flowing in. Um, sorry, there was a question there. Where is it going? Um, Dean, that's the one who says, I have two development sites. Can you do quotes on these for me? I'm sure you can, Danny, but um, probably one where um, it would be good for Dean to follow up uh, with you after just the email, webinar. Just email us at invest at triple zero property.com.au, which is up on the screen there. And uh, just shoot me an email with some information. I'll probably need to understand where it is and some other stuff, but uh, always happy to help out and look out uh, with what we can do. And I would urge people to, to, to follow up by making contact directly with Danny. Um, if you've got further questions or interested in uh, taking advantage of the services that he offers. Um, Jeff, is, is, um, there's a lot of questions that relate to, we've been talking a bit about Ballarat and Bendigo, and there's a lot of questions relating to that area. And Jeff's wondering about, what about some of the smaller hill change towns and sort of in that general area? Um, perhaps between Ballarat and Bendigo, um, places like Malden, for example, Castle, Maine. Um, they're, they're smaller towns, um, but I guess they benefit from being in a quite a broader area and close to Melbourne. What do you think, Danny? Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, you've got to look at who's going to be renting my property, who's going to be living in this property, because obviously we don't want a property sitting there vacant. Uh, yes, we want to chase the growth, and I think those areas will still, still see growth, but... You're looking at, you know, we want to, I guess, maximise the pool of investors or of, of tenants, uh, possible tenants, and that's where I tend to probably stick with more of those centres that have slightly bigger population uh, areas there, but certainly uh, the areas that I still think we'll, we'll see growth. I think this, the, the growth, though, or where you're going to get your maximum return is is been in those those centres where they've got the schools, they've got the, the work, the employment, uh, because you might have one person who's, who's working in Melbourne, but the other partner may be looking at uh, alternative work uh, or pick up work locally. We've got kids or teenagers who might want to work in the cafe or, or at Woolies um, or at the, at the supermarket or the, the local fish and chip shop. So um, uh, 
Um, so you just need to factor in all those other bits and pieces as well. Amanda said, says, uh, duplexes seem to be an issue in Victoria. Why is this? Are you aware of that as a, as a problem? Uh, you, no, I'm not aware of that being a problem. I think there's always a change. It comes around, the, I guess, the um, going through the DA and the, the DA process uh, and being able to do that properly. Uh, every council has their own regulations and rules. So, again, you've just got to be working with your local government to be able to make sure that's right. Uh, we haven't come across um, any major issues with the duplex. Uh, there are probably additional costs that need to be taken into account, so just got to look at that. But again, for me, is um, I don't just invest where I live, I invest where I'm going to make money. So it's about looking at where, where can I do it from an affordable perspective, but also do that in the, in the right way. But but uh, it can be done. Uh, I don't see why it would be any more difficult. I think it is anyone trying to do it themselves, there's a lot of hurdles to overcome. And so uh, in both the lot selection or the block selection through to the design and meeting the requirements for council, certain developers don't want them and so they, they don't allow them in their estates, but it doesn't mean you have to be in those estates. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess Cam was asking a couple of questions about Ballarat and Bendigo and one of them is um, if you had a choice between the two, which would you go, go for is Ballarat at its peak, um, do you think there's further growth? Um, which between the two, if you had to make a choice? Um, look, I think Bendigo is great. I think uh, there's real good options in Bendigo. Um, uh, I think Ballarat certainly proven for those who probably, uh, for their first one, they want a little bit more comfort. They might find Ballarat where they feel more comfortable. I think they're both great areas. I just don't. It just comes down to uh, Bendigo is a little bit cheaper, and so the yields are a little bit stronger at the moment. Um, uh, I think the people that really benefit out of Ballarat are those who, who uh, depends, I guess, when you, if you're looking at buying in the next six to 12 months, you probably lean towards Bendigo. If you're looking at being able to do something now, then there's still great opportunity in, in Ballarat. Um, I can't answer that one, Terry. It's, it's, they're both strong. I guess it comes down to your exit strategy. I mean, it, it depends on the individual to a certain degree. I mean, the, quite often the questions that people ask, are particularly about location, there's no one right answer. It, often the answer depends on the individual, what they already own, how much they can afford to spend and all of that. Uh, Steve's asking about Aubrey Wodonga, which is certainly a market that I'm very interested in. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that market, Danny? Yeah, it certainly had a lot of press lately, hasn't it, with, uh, with the border bubble. But, um, you yeah, look, I think uh, it's, it's good. I think there's, um, it's an area that will always, uh, I think, do okay because it's, obviously it's, it's really good infrastructure that's there and further infrastructure that's coming in. Um, um, another one is um, Wangaratta as well. There's another area, I think, which is quite good. Orange. Uh, and, even Tamworth, there's some opportunities out there in those areas. So uh, we didn't really talk about uh, um, New South Wales, regional New South Wales, but there's some really good markets. Again, it comes down to your overall strategy, where what property you hold, and then it's about then coming together and, and then finding the right option, the right package that meets the demographics to, to help additional growth in that property through 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 building the right style of property in that area. But yeah. Aubrey Wodonga, I don't know if it's an issue there. Yeah, I think Aubrey Wodonga is a fantastic place for investors to consider at the moment. It's got a, particularly it's got an economy beautifully set up to withstand the, the forces of the pandemic. Most of its jobs are in sectors that are expanding, not contracting um, at times like these. Very affordable, great rental yields. <clears throat> and it's a good opportunity to buy property, um, establish property um, on large blocks of land where you can subdivide and build, build new dwellings. So that's an opportunity that um, particularly applies to Aubrey Wodonga. Um, Nash is asking, uh, do you look at areas like Bundaberg and Toowoomba? Do you have... Yeah. Uh, we are doing uh, some stuff in Bundaberg, but more around the special disability accommodation, which we haven't talked about today. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, look, I, Bundaberg is is for me no at the moment. I think there's some opportunities there, but again, it's looking at the longer term prospects. 
Toowoomba, yes, I think there's some opportunities in Toowoomba. But again, Toowoomba's had some really good growth. Um, again, it comes down to the individual. When I look at a client and we look at their affordability, we look at what they want to spend, it's then trying to come up with the best option that we can for a client. And so I think uh, we tend to take a, initially a, a macro view of the whole thing is, is when we sit down with a client, ascertain what is the purpose of buying this property? What are you wanting to achieve? Based on that, then we can look at time frames, look at what's going on, and then pull an option together for a client that suits them, their comfort level. Um, some people do have a preference. I think one of the big mistakes people make when they invest is they invest where they live because that's what they know and that's what they're comfortable with. Or they turn their own home into an investment. That's one of the biggest mistakes people can make and they get their structure wrong. Um, one of the pitfalls, uh, going back to those pitfalls, make sure you've got a good accountant and accountant that really understands property and give you the right advice. If you're dealing with a financial planner, that your financial planner is property focused. Um, a lot of financial planners um, have all the right intent, but they don't understand property. And so to them, it's all shares, 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 and nothing but shares uh, or managed funds because that's where they get paid as well. Uh, being a little cynical there, but um, uh, again, talk to the people. Uh, look, property is an asset class, just as shares are. I love properties. I'm very passionate about property. And we're very passionate about helping people in property. And that's where we've seen the success that we've had with our clients over the last 15 years. Okay. Look, there's still questions coming in, and I thank um, all our listeners and viewers for that. Uh, but uh, we've, we've now been going for an hour and 15 minutes, so it's probably a good a good time for us to wrap things up. If people do have further questions that we didn't get a chance to answer today, um, please um, feel free to contact uh, Danny directly. Contact details on the screen, or you could contact myself if you want to ask some questions about location. But I would urge people to, to follow up and talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with Danny um, in terms of uh, how the process works, uh, the opportunities that are uh, on offer, and also that special offer that Triple uh, Zero Property is making uh, for today's webinar. So thank you, Danny Buxton. That's, that's been a, a great webinar. We've had lots of positive feedback and comments coming through as, as you've been presenting. Wes Green, for example, says, great webinar, Danny. I think it has been great information, nicely presented, and uh, uh, thanks for your, uh, your contribution. Well, thank you, Terry, and thank you to all the listeners out there who are listening or who will download the, uh, this um, uh, later on down the track. Uh, look, always here to help, um, but uh, look, everyone, just stay safe. Um, please don't rush any decision that you make. Uh, with investing, you spend a lot of money, so it's important you get it right. It's important you build your team, you have the right people around you. Uh, look, subscribe to, I know Terry hasn't asked me to do this, but look, those hot spotting reports are, are really uh, a great value uh, and are really worthwhile for anyone thinking of investing. And, and just find the right people around you who are independent to give you the right strategic advice to help you make the right decisions for your future, because it's your future. So uh, thank you very much, Terry, for having me, and I look forward to catching up with you again next week. As okay. we, uh, and thank you, Wes Green, for your comment. Uh, John Butler says, great information, much appreciated. Thank you, John. Gideon says, uh, great, great webinar, thanks. Um, Tamara, your question about sort of cost per square metre, I, I would urge you to follow up with Danny. The contact details are on the screen uh, and, and to others who have uh, specific questions about costs and processes and services, um, please make contact with Danny. Danny, I'd love to hear from you and um, you might be able to um, take advantage of his uh, information and knowledge and the services that are on offer. So once again, thanks, Danny. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for participating. Let's do it again soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.